to start getting into the details of, of membranes and uh, we're going to particularly uh, pay attention to this first topic of video microfiltration. Based on uh, the feedback we got um, from, from you guys in the local papers that you filled out, the, I, I posted actually on the website what, what the different people want to look at in the course, uh, in the particular section on membranes. And it works one way I, I decided to structure structure that will follow, follow the process. Um, but I thought to work through this list going down. So we're going to look at essentially large particle size uh, today, 10 to uh, 0.1 micrometers, and then we're going to get smaller and smaller over the next four or five months. Uh, so initially we're going to be looking at pressure gradients of the drying and flowing the membrane. And then when we start to get to dialysis, uh, we're, we're going to be looking at concentration gradients. And um, I've been speaking here to the hospital and we're going to see if we can try and get a dialysis membrane and uh, so we can actually get to see what that looks like uh, to see it in your hands. Um, but we'll, we'll see if I can get that, get that done. So, the slide here we're at, uh, uh, this slide over here is called the transport, the general equation for, for transport phenomena. Um, so let's just spend a little bit of time on this slide to introduce some terminology that are relevant to membranes. But this equation over here is not something that's unfamiliar to you. This is something you've seen uh, probably even from the second and third year and uh, in other courses. It's, it's an extremely common equation. What it, essentially what it says is that all transport phenomena, any movement of, of mass or even energy uh, or electrical current follows this, follows this general rule that the transfer rate divided by the transfer area, uh, that ratio of the, of the rate to which we transfer divided by the, the unit surface area is called the flux. We looked at that last class. But that flux is a function of, of uh, two major factors. Let's start over here on the right. The driving force divided by the resistance. Uh, that resistance term, we can expand a little bit and uh, and just put it put it out here and introduce some terminology. We'll say the resistance is a function of the membrane thickness and the permeability properties of the membrane. Okay, so the general the general one I want you to remember is all the way over here on the right that the flux is equal to the driving force divided by resistance. The driving force is always going to be delta p for the membranes we're looking at initially, and later on that driving force will change. Everything else is lumped up into this very broad term, which we'll just call resistance. Uh, resistance is a function, uh, if we just go down here to this last, second last slide, resistance is a function of the membrane thickness, the viscosity and density of the fluid, the porosity of the membrane, the pore size of the membrane, the properties of the solids that we're dealing with, it's a very, very hard to define term. And in fact, we will see as we go through this material in today's class, even the term, the term and the units for resistance keep on changing depending on the situation that we're dealing with. So resistance is not something we can just nail down and give it a single definition. It's always going to be case dependent. Um, so just some more more terminology, we take that flux, we'll, my preference for this course is to deal with flux as the letter J, and I will particularly use J in units of mass per, per time, so kilograms per second divided by area. So in J, in my notes, we'll refer to mass flux. Please be careful when you look at journal publications and other, other publications, they will sometimes use mass flux and sometimes they will use volumetric flux, so meters cubed per second. I will I will use kilograms specifically for capital J. So if we take that uh, and we try to find that break that J down just a little bit, uh, we we can call it this this terminology over here is is if I can call dV by dt. That's the change in the volume over time, so meters cubed per second per unit area. And then if we want to express our mass. Uh, if we want to express our flux as a mass flux, J, um, we would need to then multiply by the, by the density of the of the fluid that's leaving through the membrane. So rho F, uh, not noted here, please add this to the slide, rho F is the density of the permeate, of the fluid leaving through the membrane. Or dV 
by dt the change in volume over time. If that's if that's steady state, uh, we can we can write that as q such that p the volumetric flow rate of the permeate. So this flux j is uh, we'll break it down into several symbols that are are, are, are familiar to us. Okay, so uh, just to just to recap here, then one over this resistance. You can see this as a mass transfer coefficient. That's why I put it in inverted commas. It's not a true mass transfer coefficient, but it plays the role of, of mass transfer coefficients that you've seen in, in other courses. Then permeability uh, divided by the thickness of the membrane. So capital L is the thickness of the membrane here, or I've just left it as, as a generic L. at some whatever the appropriate thickness is. If you've got a buildup of material on the membrane, so it's the membrane plus some buildup of, of solid material, that would be the apt capital L to use. So we'll, we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. And the key, the key issue is that that length through which we're, we're uh, the fluid is flowing through the membrane, that distance is hard to pin down. Right? We can't measure it very easily. It's, it's micrometer thickness. And it includes the membrane thickness as well as any cake buildup. Uh, that cake builder may not be uniform. So we tend not to try and focus on capital L, rather we lump this permeability divided by L and we just call that permeance. So the permeance of the membrane includes the variable uh, thickness of the cake as well as the membrane thickness. So permeance inversely re related to resistance. So in, this, in, this, in the notes here, what I've, what I've moved to is to use this purple colors whenever I'm introducing new terms that we need to be comfortable. Then is, a, is a definition or something that's new, new to the topic. Okay. And then finally, uh, permeance or inverse resistance, if, if you want to see it that way. Both of those um, terms, the units, like I said, for resistance are not easy to pin down. There's no single uniform definition in the, in the books and literature on it. It very much is just calculated as whatever your choice of the driving force was. So the driving force, if you decided it is measured in Haskell um, or PSI, whatever your choice is of the driving force, or it might even be as we'll see later, the driving force is now a concentration gradient rather than a pressure gradient. So driving force's units will change. The flux J's units will change. And then as a result of that, the resistance units will be dependent on, on what, what we've chosen for those two. So again, it's, it's phenomenally frustrating to read uh, this, the literature on name rates because there's no uniform <coughs> on notation and units. Um, you, you start reading one book and then you go over to another one and units are different, the, the notation is different, and, and it can be quite frustrating. I'm trying to uh, use a consistent set of units here in, in the notes. And you'll see we emphasize that in the later slides. Okay, and then as I said here at the bottom, depending on the case, whether we're dealing with microfiltration or dialysis or ultrafiltration, some if we're in reverse osmosis, that resistance term will, will be a different, uh, have a different structure and, and different units even. Okay, so let's just take a look then at microfiltration, which is what I hope to cover in today's class and end up with an example. Um, microfiltration is really the the first type of membrane that you're going to look at, if you're coming down to sizes, uh, we would tend to just use ordinary filtration above 10 microns or even as low as 5 microns. You could get away with just a regular filter, um, filter paper, filter media, drawing a vacuum or a pre putting a pressure difference across it. But those conventional filter papers and mediums are not effective below about 5 microns. That's when we start to look at membranes as an alternative. Remember, we said in the, in the earlier class that uh, when we're unable to achieve something, we often look to nature, and membranes are nature's way of, of, of uh, filtering out particles that are incredibly small size. So we are looking here at, uh, in, the, in the 0.1 to 10 micron range. Below 0.1 micron, we move to what's called ultrafiltration, which is what I'll look at in, in the next class. Uh, for microfiltration, our flows are uh, uh, Sorry, our membranes rather are symmetric. Remember, Hank in, in the, his intro class had introduced the concept of symmetric and asymmetric membranes. So the asymmetric membrane is where there's a, an additional layer. Um, you could almost argue that that, that thin boundary over there isn't asymmetric um, beginning over there. 
So we'll look at that in the next class. But generally, for symmetric, it doesn't matter how we look at this membrane from the top or the bottom, it looks the same to you. So, so that's for microfiltration, we tend to have that. And a very open structure, the porosity is very, very high. So as high as 0.8, indicating that the, the surface area of open space divided by the total surface area is as high as 0.8. So as the liquid flows from the top down, this is a cross-sectional view of the membrane. If we're looking at the, the membrane from the top, the percentage open area visible to the fluid or the, uh, um, or the feed would be as high as 0.8%. The membranes tend to be made of polysulfone, which is uh, the type of polymer you can, uh, it's not something that I'm going to go into in this class, uh, is the polymer side of things. Uh, so that, that's a hyperlink over there that you can read a bit more about it. Interesting polysulfone, according to that Wikipedia link, was used in uh, the Apollo space mission for the, for the, for the guys. Uh, then and coated with additional layers, but the, the bulk of, the, of their protective suits are polysulfone. Uh, so there's a bit more about the chemistry and that on that link. The driving force through these membranes, pretty moderate driving forces. These are not high pressure differences. Um, we'll, we'll see much higher pressure differences in, in some of the other membranes. As a result, um, we get high fluxes at low, new definition here, TMP, transmembrane pressure. So the pressure difference from the feed side to the permeate side, that delta P is the transmembrane pressure. So that's, these are moderate pressures here, moderate TMPs through that membrane. And the area where we use microfiltration is um, one very common application is for clarification of, of, of beverages, wine, beer, juices, uh, harvesting of cells. So if you're in a, in a bioreactor case or bio applications area, we would um, use these membranes to put out our initial harvest from the bioreactor through the membrane to concentrate up the, uh, the, or to basically reduce the volumes of the material we have to work with then in subsequent steps. So we use this as a preliminary uh, unit operation in the downstream side after the bioreactor in the flow sheet. Uh, so in, for, for those of you who are not in the bio area, the preliminary reactor would then do most of your work for the, in the bio flow sheet. And then everything from the bioreactor downwards where you start to separate and purify your components we lump into its terminology, the downstream section. Um, so this would be one of the first unit ops in the downstream parts on the bioflushing. Bacteria and virus removal for sanitary applications, um, and then air filtration in certain cases, and then in the hospitals, they would use these membranes uh, for cytology, so when they flew in, um, they, they tend to take a whole sample from your body, from your stomach, or from a, a different part of your body, just to concentrate up and, and remove the fluid, um, they'll use these, these microfiltration membranes to, to concentrate that up and then deal with a smaller volume for their subsequent studies. So it's a very, it's a good preliminary separation. You have high fluxes, that's the key reason why. So we get, we get a high throughput uh, and we concentrate up our, our, our stream. So let's just introduce a bit of terminology here and, and, and we're going to start dealing with the equations for the rest of the class and end up with an example where we, where we use this equation over here. So just a notation, we have our membrane, our feed side obviously over here with the solute slowly building up against the wall and then our permeate passing through the membrane. That permeate flux is capital J, kilograms per unit, kilograms per, per time per unit area. So kilograms per second per meter squared in SI. The viscosity term in this equation simply is part of the resistance. So if we come back to that original equation, flux is equal to our driving force divided by resistance. This whole denominator here is an estimate of the resistance being offered by this membrane. And there's two elements of resistance here. Uh, coming back to the mass transfer concept you've learned in, in, in previous courses, we can, we can sum our resistances up and we see here that there's a resistance due to the membrane itself, and then there's a resistance due to the buildup of the solute against the membrane. So if I have an absolutely clean membrane with no, no solute buildup, this term, this resistance due to the cake, the subscript C refers to the cake buildup, would be zero on a pure clean membrane with pure feed. With 
be building up once we're at steady state. That resistance term there, RC, is the resistance due to the cake buildup. Built RC would be a property of the material and the solids built up against the membrane surface. So how do those solids pack up against the membrane would affect RC. The properties of the solid, its density and its packing ability, and, and the particle size of those density, of those particles would be what, what affects RC. LC then is the effective length or thickness of the cake. So the effective length that the solute has to pass through may not necessarily be uniform, um, but it's, a, it's an estimate of the length of the cake through which the solute has to pass, would be, the, would be capital LC. So that's the resistance offered due to the cake. Then there's a resistance offered due to the membrane. Rm, the membrane properties that affect that resistance, that would be the pore size of the, of the, of the holes on the membrane, the porosity of the membrane through, um, if we go back and look at this, this microscope picture, so how this tortuosity or the pathways uh, through that membrane, the porosity, the percentage opening area on that membrane, as well as some of the other electrical properties of that membrane itself. So these polymers may be charged in some way and they'll be, um, they'll be charged, uh, the solute may bind through onto the membrane preferentially. Um, we'll see that especially later on. Um, for microfiltration, that's not too much of an issue. But all those types of terms would be lumped into RN, an effective resistance offered by the membrane itself, multiplied by the length of the membrane. So that LN uh, is, could be relatively easy to measure if we've controlled our membrane um, while well, we've made it. Uh, very well, we can have an estimate of the LN. But pretty much everything else in this denominator is incredibly hard to estimate. And any estimates we do make of it from any theoretical equations would, would definitely have some high degree of error. So we have to be um, resort to laboratory experiments and so on to, to estimate those. Then mu would be the estimate of the permeance viscosity. So this whole denominator term uh, is, is the total resistance due to the membrane and due to the, due to the cake Okay, so let's take a look at two geometries that, that we see for microfiltration. One is we, uh, we would run it in what's called the dead-end flows geometry, and the other is called the cross-flow geometry. So dead-end flow would be like the regular filter that you've seen in the lab. You put your filter paper down, or in this case you put the membrane down, and you apply a delta P across that membrane, and that solute builds up over time. That cake becomes thicker and thicker as time progresses. We would only do this if we've got a very low concentration of feed. So this would be uh, sort of the, the use in a hospital, like where I have an example of the cytology, where there's a, a small sample that's just being filtered out, and you're essentially just using a membrane as your filter medium rather than a filter paper. So you're just, you're just exchanging uh, your medium over there for filtration. The regular filtration equations and the regular filtration theory applies to, to the situation. Um, so it's, it's, you can use air filtration, you've got a very low percentage of solids in your air or a low percentage of material that you want to trap uh, or virus removal or hospital applications. The main reason why we don't uh, want this running for too long is obviously because the memory will become clogged. Contrast that then to the cross-flow geometry, which is where we're looking at continuous applications that are running all the time. So uh, water treatment. This is where we're moving to a tangential flow coming in. And our membrane over here, which is the dashed line, here, this is just a solid retaining wall. But here's our membrane over here, it's a dashed line. That membrane then is retaining the, the particles and the retentate leaves out on the other side. Now, what would what be the reasons for running something this way? Less fouling. How, how does the lower fouling come about? So the movement of the feed moves those particles along. There's a bit of a shearing effect over there, keeping the resistance due to the cake buildup low. So if we go back then to, to this original equation, the resistance offered by the cake buildup, this RC, is going to be kept low. 
we can keep RC low, we can keep, get our flux up. And that's, that's always what we're aiming for with membranes, is to get that flux capital J as high as we can for a given surface area. Okay, so J is a function of the volumetric flow rate divided by the surface area. Membranes are expensive. For a fixed surface area, we'd like to maximize that J through, through the membrane as much as possible. Two ways we can do that to maximize J, one is obviously to increase the delta P, the, the pressure difference through the membrane, the transmembrane pressure, or reduce any of these resistances in the denominator by as much as possible. So we can reduce the membrane thickness uh, to a point, but we can't go too far, otherwise those membranes will rupture with the pressure differences we put through across it. So LM, there's a, there's a lower bound on LM, but anything we can do to decrease these resistances uh, would be great. So tangential flow filtration then is a way to, to do that. Uh, because we're running these units in, in a continuous mode, there's going to be an accumulation of cake on that, on that uh, surface over there. If we're running this in cross flow at high velocity, we can shear off that accumulated cake builder and get it out of the system. We, um, we're probably interested in the permeate, um, and we may be interested as well, obviously, in the feed. So it doesn't matter that you're shearing this off, we, we want to get this out and into the retentate and not building up on that surface for us over there. So if we can reduce that cake resistance term by as much as possible, that would be, that'd be great. So notice here, um, I call this RC dash. Let's just talk a little bit about this terminology here. RC dash refers to the total resistance offered by the cake. That comes down to the sum, or the product rather, of RC the resistance due to the cake properties, and then the effective length of the cake. Because I don't know the thickness of the cake, um, it's impossible for me to measure it really. Um, I'm just lumping them up together and calling it RC dash. And in this figure here, I'm trying to illustrate that a little bit. Uh, obviously, when this feed comes right in, there's going to be an incredible amount of shearing. So that cake thickness will be less. But after a very short time into the membrane, that cake thickness is going to be built up and stay probably pretty much at a uniform thickness throughout the, throughout the rest of that uh, fiber or that surface. So for the most part, that thickness would be constant, but it's not something that's easily measured. And uh, the way we, we quantify delta P in, in cross flow filtration is to say it's the average pressure on this feed side. So pressure of the feed in plus the pressure, oh, oops, please correct this, uh, that's P in plus P out. So the average pressure on above the membrane on the feed side, so P in plus P out divided by two. So that's the pressure above the membrane minus the pressure on the permeate side. So this is an estimate of the transmembrane pressure delta P. Whereas on the dead end flow, it's very easy and obvious what, the, what that pressure difference is. It's pressure across across the membrane. <coughs> okay, so if we take a look then at, at this equation for uh, this general equation, we're going to see this one come up over and over in, in the, over the next few classes. Uh, this, this equation applies not just to microfiltration, um, it applies to all, all types of membranes, and furthermore, it also applies to all types of geometries. Okay, so whether we're running in dead-end flow or in cross-flow, this equation would apply. This would be your go-to equation for any any work. So if we're, if we're looking at this equation now applied to the dead-end flow case, we're seeing our thickness of our cake LC increases with time as that batch mode type filtration progresses. LC is going to get larger and larger. Um, that implies if I, if I form the product of this and I call this RC dash, that resistance term increases with time. The resistance due to the membrane itself is unlikely to change over time. So that's just due to the membrane properties and the membrane thickness, neither of which are changing. The viscosity of the permeate is not changing. And if I keep delta P constant, um, so I'm always just applying the same pressure difference across that membrane, then the implication is that as RC grows, or, sorry, this product of the two terms grows over time, then my flux must drop. And that's, that's an intuitive expectation. The flux decreases as this cake builds up and becomes thicker and thicker. We get lower and lower fluxes. 
So the tangential uh, flow geometry is a way then to counteract that a bit by preventing RC times LC from growing large at the time. That's the aim of tangential flow, is to keep that resistance low. Um, and the, the velocities that we would typically use are as, as high as 8 meters per second, which is phenomenally high. It's going to provide a good amount of shearing and keep, keep that uh, solute from building up against the membrane flows. Okay, so, and, and then obviously the, the expectation is for a given pressure drop, this is really the operating cost of it. So for a given dollars that you're spending on your membrane, uh, a cross flow geometry is going to get you a higher flux in the dead end geometry, which is good. Um, delta P is, a, is, a, is almost purely your only operating cost for these membranes. And so we want to maximize the flux that we get for a given dollar value spent or for a given delta P that we use. The other thing is uh, to bear in mind is we can't interchange the, the values from the dead end geometry from the cross flow geometry. For, but what I mean by that is if I'm using a lab test, that's done in dead end mode to estimate mass transfer resistances. I can't go assume that that same resistance applies in cross flow mode. Um, that, that should be clear because this cross flow mode has a very different way that it's affecting the solids. And so that K thickness resistance is, is definitely going to be a very different resistance in cross flow mode, uh, this RC in dead end mode, this cross flow mode, two totally different numbers. So we can't interchange results uh, from, from different ways of operating. Okay, so with that in mind, um, okay, wait, yeah, let's just cover these two more slides. I just wanted you to think about some things, um, but let's just look at this. This will give a typical flow sheet for cross flow filtration. Here's our feed that we're, we're going to treat. So uh, this would come from a, the bioreactor or from the upstream operation, would, would, be, would be available for us in this, in this vessel. Variables need pump to transport it to the membrane. So here's the membrane over here. We, we pump, we're applying our pressure difference on the feed side in this flow sheet. Uh, that's, that, that's basically the first option over here. We'll talk about the second option in a minute. We're, we're pro providing our, um, our pressure at the feed. We may or may not heat it up to modify the viscosity. Flow meter for flow control. And then here are the valves to manipulate this pressure. This feed material then passes through the membrane and splits into two, the permeates leaving out the top, and then the retentate leaving out the bottom over here. So there's pressure measurements over here, pressure measurements over there um, for, for, for process control. That retentate uh, would then come back. This is now a far more concentrated version of the feed. And uh, could be could be simply recycled. All we want to do is just, if we're interested in the permeate, we can simply keep that recycling. Um, I would want to see on this flow sheet at least a bleed of some sort, so you take some of your concentrate out, so you don't accumulate too much. Um, but it, again, it just depends on the application. It might be a relatively small batch that needs to be treated, so it doesn't matter too much that this concentrate keeps recycling around. But ideally, there would be a bleed off somewhere over here to take that concentrate out to prevent excessive buildup. The reason for that is we don't want too high concentration, so we often will supply wash liquid to dilute this uh, material as well to keep our solids percentage down. The permeate would then leave and that would be our product of interest. It may, it may be recycled as well to some extent, but some percentage of it recycled to keep, again, the concentrations down of the solids. Very interestingly, what uh, we do from time to time then, is we would use compressed air then in that flow sheet. So compressed air, we would, sh we would temporarily shut, shut down our feed over here, I close that valve, open this valve, and, and close this permeate valve, and then just force compressed air backwards through the membrane and blow off the solids that have accumulated on the feed side. So we push those solids backwards through the membrane and uh, have them dumped back into the feed vessel, just clearing out the membrane periodically. So we can see that a bit over here. Um, if these units are running in continuous time and I did not have back flush, or, uh, what would happen is that for a given velocity, my flux over time would slowly decrease. So this is very common for microfiltration. You lose about 30 to 50% of your flux as you start that membrane, just as the 
you know, initially get very, very high drops and then very rapidly this would drop and settle off um, down to a certain flux at a given velocity. If I can increase the velocity through the, through the membrane, I would then get operating curve B. So higher velocities get you higher fluxes. So A is a low velocity, B is a higher velocity. C is the operating mode with periodic backflush. So periodically, we realize we're getting a reduction in our flux. Backflush, blow compressed air through, force those solids off the surface, back into the circuit, and then uh, <coughs> operate in that sawtooth pattern to, to, to keep the membrane clean and maximize our flux. So we, we suffer a little bit of reduction in our throughput because of that time that we have to close the valves and, and force compressed air backwards. But it keeps our fluxes high, so on average we, we get a higher throughput over time. Okay. So, so that's the advantage of back flush. And then um, the other way that we can operate this circuit is here I'm applying the pressure through the feed side through a pump. However, I could easily draw a vacuum on the permeate side and then rather than pushing through the circuit, I'm pulling through. So it's just a, either you push or you pull through the membrane. And then Hank made the, the great observation in, the, in his intro to classes. Well, if we're pushing, we can go to pressure differences that are very, very great, over one or two or three atmospheres. Whereas if you're pulling and your feed is at atmospheric pressure, at best you can pull is at most 0.8 of an atmosphere. Um, so you're, you're reduced in that delta P if you're, if you're deciding to use vacuum. Or you're reduced to the extent of that delta P that you can, can achieve. Whereas if you're pushing, pump, you can go to higher and higher delta P's, you're only limited by your energy costs um, to, to do that. So, so those, are, those are the two strategies one could use. Okay, so what I'd like you to think about is this case, and we'll, um, we'll take five minutes or so and discuss this with the neighbor next to you. This is, this is important um, for you to think about things in this way. What we're looking at is seeing these equations we've seen so far in these geometries of the fluid flow. How would you, if you had to do this now, go about symbolically, so just, just in symbols, uh, there's no specific numbers you have to use, determine the size of the membrane. If you were asked to design it for a given flow rate of permeate, so you know you, you require a certain flow rate of permeate, what would be the size and the surface area of that membrane? You've got a budget to buy equipment to do experiments, and you've got various membrane samples from different suppliers. What would you do, and how would you set up your lab experiment to get the information that you need to size the camera? So just think about it for a few minutes. Please uh, discuss it with the person around you, and uh, we'll take some ideas. You go back to the equations, look at what you know, what you don't know, and those that you don't know, how could you get it from an experimental technique?
Okay, so what are the unknowns? What are the, what are the pieces of information to design this membrane that we would need to know? That we don't have available to us. Um, so I guess the first thing you have to do is find like the RMLM for each of the membranes. Okay, RMLM. Other pieces of information we don't know. Okay, so the plots we're looking to achieve. Uh, if we uh, write out the equation for J is the density of the permeance times the flow rate Q divided by the surface area A. We don't know the flux. We, we do know the density of the permeance. We know the flow rate that we desire it. So the flow rate divided we must we need a certain flow rate. And then our unknown here is A. That's the surface area that we're looking for. Once we have those, we then we would get the flux. So you write it. It's an unknown because it's an unknown due to the area, that, which is what we're trying to look for, the size. Yeah. Sorry? RC and LC. Okay, so RC and LC, the resistance due to the cake and the, and the thickness of that cake. How would we go about finding those with laboratory experiments? of the fluid, the pure feed fluid, times the resistance due to the fluid. That's uh, right, due to the membrane. Okay. If RM is what we're after, that's easily solved, given the laboratory setup where we could measure delta P. So we've said here we have a reasonable budget, we would easily be able to measure the pressure difference through the membrane, we'd easily be able to measure the flux, J. For a known membrane that we have, J is very easy to measure. It's simply equal to the kilograms per second per meter squared of membrane. So in a lab, you would simply measure your, your volume or your mass of material that you've accumulated through the membrane for the membrane area that you've exposed. So J is, is measurable in the laboratory environments. Delta P is measurable, U would be known or, or, or measured, and then as a result we would then be able to estimate what this resistance term is for RM. So after that, running that pure feed, you would then know what your RM measures. So we've eliminated these two. So this is Rm dash. It would be given by the product of those two.
RC and LC. How would we estimate the resistance due to the K count? Same experiment, but you introduce the solute. Same experiment, but you introduce the solute. So now we run with the with the regular stream that we plan to run in production. We now know what the resistance is due to the membrane. That's not going to change if we run with 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 solids in our stream or without solids in the stream. Rm is independent of Rc, so the membrane's resistance does not change when when you start to add your your solids to the stream. Rc is then now calculated in exactly the same way. We, we feed our, our membrane of a given surface area, and we measure the flux coming out of it, J, and we apply a known pressure drop delta P that we measure. We know mu, and we know Rm dash. As a result, we can calculate Rc. So let's just break down those experiments in the lab a little bit more, um, to be specific. So, so run your regular feed at a known delta P. So I'm going to call this delta PI because we can do several experiments. So put a known pressure drop over, over that uh, over that membrane that you measure. Uh, Measure the corresponding flux. Okay. And then that calculates the resistance due to the cake. Okay, so what you can then do is you can plot uh, that calculate RC dash because you know, now know everything in that equation except for RC dash. You could also uh, vary, vary these pressure drops. You could all run, run your lab experiments at different delta pressures and measure corresponding different fluxes. Okay, so if I had to guess what a plot like that would look like, so here's my delta P and here's my J. If I had to plot the flux uh, J at different delta pressures, I would expect something as my pressure difference increase I would get something that looks along that line. I would guess. I haven't looked at that. Um, and that would then tell me now, now I can start to address this equation. So we can get back to our, our final answer that we're looking at. We're looking at sizing this membrane. We're looking at calculating the area A. So what I can do is I can I can I say, well, I know what Q is. My, 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 my specifications for a given flow rate Q, I know what the density of my permeate is. Find the corresponding J, then, that gives me that, that area. So I would I can do my trial and error, pick an area and calculate J, and then come across here and find what your operating pressure difference needs to be. Or you can pick a pressure difference and then go up and calculate J, and then from that, you calculate your surface area A. So either way, either way can work, depending on your you can spe if you can specify your delta P, um, if you get to choose your delta P, um, you can come up here and across, take your J, and once you have J, you go up on and calculate your surface area A. And then notice here I said at the start uh, we have a variety of membrane samples available from different suppliers. You would then repeat all these experiments several times with these different membrane samples. Because what you would find is that some membranes would give you higher fluxes. At, at, at a low pressure drop. That would be very desirable to get a higher, higher uh, flux at a low pressure drop on one supplier's membrane versus another supplier's membrane. means that you can then operate and get your higher fluxes at less energy, less money. So you wouldn't just do this experiment once on a given membrane. We'd repeat it several times on a variety of them. Okay, so if we, let's see 
how we do it for time. Okay, so yeah, I'll cover this topic tomorrow. Uh, what I'll just, uh, we'll just discuss here then obviously is if you wanted to, for a given setup, for a given setup of, of the microfiltration membrane, if you wanted to improve the flux, here's a number of things that one could do. And they're, they're now obvious to you based on the discussion we've had so far this morning. So this would be almost a recap. To improve that flux, capital J, we would then increase anything in the numerator over there, so that's, that would be our pressure difference. And then we also want to decrease any of our resistances. So uh, by regular back flush, we would be able to decrease our resistance. Uh, we could also choose a different membrane structure uh, and alter the membrane's resistance. We would alter our feed concentration. Uh, that would, would reduce the amount of taking that we're forming, so it would reduce the length of the cake. If we increased our shear rate, that velocity in the cross flow, that would decrease LC, the length of the cake. The temperature of the feed would decrease the viscosity. And then finally, uh, the nature of the solids deposited would affect RC. So let's just uh, think about that for a minute. If we're saying the nature of the solids would affect the resistance of the cake. What I mean by that is sometimes the way the solids are shaped would obviously affect how they pack onto the membrane. So if you think of perfect spheres, which is obviously non-ideal, uh, or not necessarily, it's, it's, it's idealistic, it's not true. Perfect spheres would deposit onto the membrane and would leave a lot of open space for fluid to flow through the spheres. But our solids are not perfectly spherically shaped. In fact, they would be almost sometimes layered if they're cellular, and they can pack over each other very, very densely, uh, leaving very little open space, and as a result, increasing the cake resistance. So if there is a way to alter how those solids pack against the surface of the membrane, that would then also uh, alter, alter your flux. And the way you might achieve that is through interesting chemistry. Uh, so you may be able to use a, an, an additive, almost like a flocculant, as it were, that modifies how those solids pack onto the membrane. That, that could be an interesting um, way to investigate reducing the resistance. Okay, so next class we'll continue on just with an example. I hope we cover it today, but I don't want to rush it, so we'll, uh, we'll talk about it next.